we've had here at the University of Houston. You know, thanks again to, of course, all Texas, but Dallas, Fort Worth for making the drive down here. Thank you. Thank you, family. Again, thank you to Tyler and Shay for coordinating, organizing the service, for being such great friends and, and family to us. Of course, the, the godparents to Elijah. We, we treasure you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you once again for everything. And I just feel like I'm being reappointed right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> You know, it, it does feel, uh, feel like a family reunion, having all of Dallas-Fort Worth in town. And you, you never know what's going to happen at family reunions. You know what I'm saying there, guys? It, what's the word you guys use? Savage. I got a pulpit for a whole, a whole like, 40 minutes here, guys. Things may get savage. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. But it's a family reunion. You know what I'm saying there, guys? You know, I, 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 I do wish we, we could go back in time to the appointment and I could take time to thank every single person here. Yeah, come on, Danielle and I do, do want to express that every single individual in DFW and Houston, our hearts are, have nothing but warmth for you, and you all have a piece of this action. Yeah. You all have a piece of, of why we're here today. Yeah. And we, we're genuinely thankful. I, I do want to also just thank Joshua Foxworthy. See him serving right there? He, he can't even stop serving right now. With the, with that, he, he, he's my first Texan that I baptized with the cowboy out there. And, uh, of, of course, he, he joined us as a ragtag group of, like, five disciples that gave, gave up playing music at Hope City, this incredible mega church and whatnot. He said, you know what, I'm going to not play music there and come to this hand-clapping church and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, of course, if you look at her with uh, the cute little baby, uh, Kiana, Kiana, Woody, Malone... And, and, it, and, of course, myself, but especially Daniela, wanted to make sure to thank Kiana. Of course, she, she's our nanny. She's the intern for the church, and she does so much for God's kingdom. She's done so much for Tyler and Shay, Matt and Helen in Orlando, of course, us here in, uh, in Dallas and in Houston. And, uh, sis, you're a daughter in the faith. I love you so, so much. Um, life would not be the same for Daniela and I without you. We love you, and we really appreciate all your servitude. Well, time's a ticking. Look over in Matthew 14. I got, a, I got a message for you this morning. I got a message for you this afternoon. This time change is really messing me up here, guys. And of course, at the beginning of Matthew 14, Jesus feeds, of course, and Matthew records 5,000 men. Now, Matthew is known as a family gospel, so it just says men there, but it would have also included women and children. So Jesus fed around 10,000 people there, including women and children there, amen, with just a few pieces of bread and a few fish. And let me tell you, they had an incredible feast, and they were all satisfied. You know, next year we'll get to 10,000 in Texas, amen? But my prayer is this morning, you're just as filled as those 10,000 were. We're going to have a spiritual feast. I don't want you thinking about lunch right now. We've got the, hangout, the hangouts planned after. I don't want you thinking about Matt. I see it. You're thinking about a burger. Don't think about a burger. Don't, stop, stop thinking about Jodwin. No, you great contour. Stop thinking about lunch, guys. We're about to have a spiritual feast. You too, Pauline. I know it. No, no think about lunch, guys. No think about barbecue. It's time to think about the Bible. Amen? Amen. On, Matthew chapter 14. Let's get filled. Amen? Before I get myself in trouble. The Bible reads right after Jesus feeds 10,000 people. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowd. Of course, that's 10,000. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, check this out, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. You know, we have an incredible passage here. After all, ultimately, the incredible miracle. Could, could you imagine just seeing a few fish and bread and seeing literally Jesus multiply it to be 10,000 people? Could you imagine that? Amen. 
But of course, right after the miracle, Jesus looks at his guys, and of course, they were the ushers for that event. <laughs> Have you ever been a server for over 10,000 people with only 12 men? Oh, yeah. I want to thank the ushers how much work they're doing right now. But imagine 10,000 people, and you got to pick up all the bread after all of them. He says, okay, I, I know you've had enough. Let's put them on the boat there. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to finish up. I'll dismiss the crowd. I'll be the usher right there. He's a great leader. So I'll be the usher for the end here. Sends them on their boat, dismiss the crowd. Then look at He goes the mountain to pray. No, you guys with me here? Take a look at this. The mountain would have been positioned in a way where you could overlook all of the lake that they were on. Why? Because in Mark 6, the parallel account, in Mark 6, 48, it says he saw the disciples straining doors. Why? While he was praying, Jesus looked out and said, <laughs> man, they're struggling out there. <laughs> look at him. Hey, man, God, let's let him keep going. He looked another hour. They're still struggling out there. <laughs> he was able to witness the disciples ultimately having a hard time. You know, after he prays, he looks, <laughs> they're still struggling out there. And he says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them out. And I imagine Jesus, this is how, of course, I'm reading in between the lines here a little bit, guys. But I imagine Jesus comes down the mountain and says, well, where's the boat? Well, I could if I try and find a boat. I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus Christ. I could ultimately, like, you know, get, get a boat to magically appear. But you know what? Let, let's do this. Let's walk on the water. Let's walk on the water. And that's really going to galvanize our faith. Can you believe that? Jesus Christ, of course, God on earth, physically walked on water. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Last time I checked, guys, like, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Like, I, I didn't get my degree from U of H. You know what I'm saying there, guys? I'm not Hugo. I didn't go to UCLA. But last time I checked, it's impossible for a man to walk on water. I don't, I don't think you guys get it. He defied gravity. He broke the laws of physics. He stepped on H2O. Yeah. You know, I gr grew up in Los Angeles, California. And of course, out there you have Universal Studios. And you're able to go there and see how a lot of different movies are made. And one of my favorite movies of all time, Bruce Almighty. And you're able to drive, go on one of the trams there and look at how some of the different sets were filmed for the movies. And you see the set for Bruce Almighty there. And it has a big uh, blue screen there to show the sky. And a big miniature lake there that's man-made to make it look like, remember when Bruce was walking in the water? And it showed how they put a layer of glass, blast, plastic, glass sort of stuff, so he could step on the water and look like he's walking in the lake. See, that's not what Jesus did. He ain't an imposter. See, Bruce Almighty's an imposter. Jesus actually stepped on H2O. But what do we understand from this? God is the God of the uh, uh, impossible. And the same God that they worshipped back then, when Jesus was physically on earth, mm -hmm. is the same God that we worship today. Yeah. Therefore, if the impossible could happen back then, I put before you, yeah, it happened in the first century, it's meant to happen in the 21st century. Yeah. 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 I put before you, church, that God wants the impossible to happen in Texas. Our lesson this afternoon, Texas, it's time to walk on water. <laughs> Do you want to walk on water, Texas? Yeah. I got like half zeal, half goo. Oh, no. oh, I'm going to call you out if I, if I see a non, non zealous face. Do you want to walk on water? Do you want to see the impossible? Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. I see you in the back, Felix. Felix is fired up too, man. Yeah. See, if you're going to do the impossible, you got to understand point number one. Now, you might ask, what's point number one? Oh, what is it, bro? Jesus sees you. Of course, Jesus is on the mountain praying. You know, he had an incredible quiet time. We'll get more of that in a second here. But he looked out and saw the disciples having, having a hard time in the lake. And like I said, it was probably comical for them, you know what I mean? Because keep in mind, these guys are teenagers. He's a 30-year-old man. Ultimately, he knows a lot more than them. And he's like, you know what? If but they would pray, probably they could get across. But he lets them struggle. I don't think it was that comical for the apostles. <laughs> Let's see if we can understand why it was such a hard time for them. Now, of course, in the Synoptic Gospels and in the book of John, this story is recorded throughout all of them. Yeah. And John records how Jesus dismissed the crowd right at sunset. And verse 25 here, it says that he goes to them at the fourth watch of the night. Now, all of us know all about the times back then. Amen? Yeah. 
we understand that's about eight to nine hours. I mean, number one, that, that's an incredible sermon in itself. But Jesus prayed eight to nine hours there. I mean, how long was your quiet time today? You know what I'm saying? There, guys, like, Jesus is the standard, eight to nine hour quiet time. But what's the reverse of that? Eight to nine hours of struggling in the water. Now, let's really try and get some deep perspective here. I want to feed you guys some meat here, amen? According to John 6, they only went three and a half miles. Now, I don't know about you. If you put Tyler and I in a boat with Jose, Jay, and you get 12 of us all together, I don't know a lot about boating. But I think we get more than three miles in nine hours. So we understand the hardship. It says the wind was against them. You ever feel like just everything's against you? They felt like everything was against them. I mean, imagine serving over 10,000 people. You're picking up all this stuff. You're tired. And, you know, following Jesus around wasn't the Jesus at the campfire. You're growing up where he's singing a kumbaya, you know what I mean? And he's super chill and peace. Yeah, let's just go hang out. Jesus was radical, revolutionary. If you follow him, you're going to be tired. It's going to push you. It's going to stretch you. It's radical. It's kind of scary. Yeah. And he serves all these people. And let me tell you, after like that much servitude and that much, quote unquote, crank, they probably want to nap. So they're on the boat, you know, they're like, all right, guys, let's, let's get across the, let's get across the, let's get across the lake. Why can't, hours later, they just want to get to bed. And they can't even get across the lake. Great lesson here. God allows great challenge before he brings about impossible miracles. Some of you got to write that down. God has great challenge before he brings impossible miracles. And let's be honest, in the midst of hardship, it's always easy to think so spiritually, right? After all, we're all so spiritual. You know what I'm saying, guys? Surely I've never struggled with thinking an unspiritual thought in the midst of hardship. Consider it pure joy, James chapter 1. Oh my gosh, what was James thinking? That's a hard scripture to follow. What's a temptation when hardship comes? Does Jesus see me? Does Jesus even see me struggling right now? Did he leave me? Uh, let's be honest. Can he help me? Does he want to help me? Has he forgotten me? How about this? Am I good enough? I mean, after I didn't have the best relationship with my parents, am I good enough for Jesus? Have I messed up too many times? Maybe he just doesn't want to help me now. Is God punishing me? And now he's smiting me because of my sin? What's the truth? Jesus did see them. What's the truth? Jesus allowed them to struggle. Why the struggle? Look over in Isaiah 43. Now, of course, the apostles struggle. We struggle. But even in 750 BC in the time of Isaiah, they needed reassurance from God as well. Let's take a look here. Let's go, Jason. I'm giving you a feast here, guys. But I'm going to keep going until, until you're full. Amen? And I'll know you're full by your zeal level. So don't, I'm going to keep my watch on for now, but let's make sure we get full from the word. Amen? Isaiah 43. God says to us, but now this is what the Lord says. Amen? He who created you, Jacob. He who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. Of course, it's the only place in Scripture where God actually says the words to you this morning, I love you. And I love it. He reminds us that he created us, that he knows us, that is sold out disciples of Jesus. He has redeemed us. We've been bought by the blood of the Lamb and freed from slavery of sin. But it gets a little more intense than that. Yeah, we're redeemed. Yeah, we're saved. But what's it say here? It says, when you pass through the waters, right. when you go through the rivers, right. when you walk. You know, it's some of us like, if. Yeah. if. If I get in some deep waters. If the big tsunami comes into my life. Yeah. 
If the fire, no, 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 no. You signed up to be a disciple. Yeah, yeah bro. Come on, bro. Come on. You, you, you didn't sign up for milk toast Christianity. You can find that at the building next door. Yeah, bro. You signed up not for a fancy room with fancy people. Yeah. You signed up to follow Jesus Christ, and it's not easy. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I'm not a very pretty preacher, but I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not going to, it says, when you walk through the fire. So even in the time of Isaiah, God still allowed people to go through the waters, to go through the fire. Why? My wife found an incredible insight for you this morning. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, of course, Peter compares our faith to gold. And of course, Peter explains how gold is put through fire. Why? To test it to check its genuineness, and to purify it. So why does God allow us to go through hot fires in our life? Well, check it out. To test us. To check the genuineness of your faith, to see if you're legitimate. And to purify us as his people. You know, for us, we must understand that we go through the fire. Why? To help our faith be of greater worth than Goals. Check it out. This is why Jesus allowed his guys to suffer. Because I believe in you. Yeah, it's hard, guys. But keep pushing. Yeah, it's hard. But I'm watching. Yeah, it's hard. But I'm going to come out to you soon. Don't give up. You know, there's so many points in my life where I felt like the apostles in the boat struggling to get through, wondering if God saw me, wondering if God had passed by, and wondering why the fire felt so hot. In 2009, I had an incredible dream, not a kingdom dream, I had a dream to be a professional bass player, and I did what all responsible 18-year-olds do, they moved to Hollywood, California with no parental supervision. Uh (laughs) It wasn't smart. (laughs) It's foolish. But of course, I was committed to be a professional musician, and I was very committed. I was very committed to my profession, and you'll hear in a minute, to my sinfulness. I, I, there was a total commitment factor. You want to talk about total commitments? We got a loan for over $20,000 with my dad's signature on it there. I mean, let me tell you, I would practice morning, afternoon, and night till my fingers would bleed. I got tons out from my parents. All my eggs were in the basket. I was going to be a bass player, not for the Lord, for Jason. I'm going to build up my life. I'm going to build up my dream. I'm going to be so awesome. You know, around the time when I was in music school, my best friend passed away. He died in impact in a car accident. His name was Joe Neal. I'll never forget just the reality of life setting in, realizing, wow, life is fragile. Wow, things can change quickly. Wow, my life could be taken quickly. During that same time, I found out my dad had a brain aneurysm. Wow, my dad can literally fall at any point. His father, my grandpa, died of brain aneurysm a few months prior to that. Sadly, at that time, questioning life, questioning all these things, questioning my purpose, questioning what's God trying to do here, I made a decision, you know what, let's plunge a little deeper into darkness. And I got into deeper areas of darkness than I thought I would ever go, waking up in this morning and say, what did I do last night? I decided to quit my dreams. I decided to move back to Denver, Colorado, and I felt like a failure. I mean, after all, I'm no longer going to be a bass player. What's the point of my life? I've literally built my entire life around this thing. But I failed. So this guy named Colton Roan, who I knew through my sister, calls me up and studies the Bible with me. That's some books on studies. I have a faith in Christ. We go through seeking God, go through some studies. He says, look, there's no church of disciples in Colorado Mm. right now. Now there is, but there wasn't back then. (laughs) He says, I want you to move to Riverside, California. Where is that? I don't know. (laughs) And I want you to come become a disciple of Jesus Christ. I said, no way. I already gave up everything. I already ran that rodeo. I already been, you think I'm going to do that again and do that to my parents? You know how that looks? No way. So, I'm, of course, I'm learning to ride a motorcycle at the time in Ninja 600s. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm in the parking lot my second time, and I'm really cranking it now. You know what I'm saying, guys? I got the little red thing. I got all the clutch going. I'm, like, I'm, I'm cranking. So I, I, you know, get the helmet on, of course, safety first and whatnot, with my jeans, and I'm cranking it through that part. It's Home Depot. I'm cranking it. <laughs> and I'm making this tight turn, like, check me out. Uh, and then there's, like, this woman and child there, and I say, oh, shit. And I grab the front brakes as tight as I can, but there's sand on the ground. So what happens? You get a turn, a motorcycle, sand, front brakes, and full speed. Oh, Boom. 
let's just say, Colt and I had to talk that night. I will be there soon. Amen. I moved to Riverside, California, and after struggling for a month, February 9th, 2011, at 10, 10 p.m., Colton, Joey Underhill, and Caesar baptized me into Christ. And I was so inspired as my calling. Now I have a new calling to help people get to heaven. Y'all yeah. never forget at the 2011 GLC, I saw Colton get appointed an evangelist. I said, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. That's why I wore my gray suit today, because he wore a gray suit when he got appointed. I was so inspired. This man, just in his young 20s, gave up so much, recently lost his mom, but said, you know what? Despite all the pain I'm going through, I'm going to preach the gospel for the rest of my life. I'm going to lead thousands to heaven because God has called me. And of course, Colton's understanding of evangelists, I get to help as many people as possible get to heaven. I said, I want to do that. And I had that dream from nine years ago. I'm going to be an evangelist in the kingdom of God. Now, of course, you know, there's years of perseverance and whatnot. But I I, I called Colton to think of the day, and he reminded me of, of 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 our beginning together. He said, Jason, before you get appointed this Sunday, do you remember where you came from? He said, you had such difficulty with your mental health that you couldn't even take a shower. From all the drugs you did in the world, all the medications you on, you were afraid to swim in the pool. You were so paranoid and scared of small spaces that you wouldn't be in a room by yourself. That because of this, the, all these disorders that you magnified ultimately because of your sin, you could not do a lot of things disciples would do. He said, Jason, your past was so impure, you did not think you could stop looking at pornography and masturbating. You didn't think you could stop womanizing women. Ultimately, your character was so low, we didn't know how faithful, how long you would stay faithful. But praise God, nine years later, Jesus faithful. Why? Because Jesus saw me. Yes, I am the most unlikely candidate to be an evangelist, but because Jesus sees me, he is able to work through me. He can work through you as well, because he sees you. You know, I'm so inspired by the ways God has worked here in Houston, and of course, all the growth that we saw last year is truly inspiring. One of the baptisms I was so grateful for was James. And of course, James is a product of Colton's perseverance with me. Isn't that awesome there, guys? Because Jesus saw me, because Colton worked with me, now we have James here today. Now, of course, James studied the Bible from a Catholic background and realized, whoa, the, the, the Bible, like, there, there's no Catholicism in the Bible. There's no worshiping Mary in the Bible. There's no Pope in the Bible. Then not, there's no praying Jesus in your heart in the Bible. He studies the Bible and says, I've got to repent of all my sins. I've got to become a biblical disciple. And then at the point of baptism, I'm going to get all my sins forgiven. And let me tell you, he became a disciple last year in April. But as he was out with the oars, the oars started feeling very heavy there. And last year, of course, as he felt the oars get heavy, as he felt the challenges, as he felt the pain, he said, you know what, this is too hard. And he allowed different sins and darkness to come into his life that ultimately devastated his faith and really hurt the Holy Spirit within him. Yeah. After his sins and after ultimately he was brought before the church, there was so much guilt in his life. He said, can I do this? He said, no, he made a decision to walk away. Yeah. He fell away from God. During that time, he will tell you, I always knew I had to come back. I just didn't know how to forgive myself. And of course, through studying the Bible, what's been the theme? James, Jesus is watching you. James, Jesus forgive you. In a day, James is getting restored to the kingdom of God. To the disciples, no matter where you at, I want to inspire you. God sees you. Jesus sees you. If Jesus can use this derelict 19-year-old bass player from Hollywood, California, he can use you. And if you're visiting today, you may not have planned to be here, but let me tell you, Jesus sees you. He knows your thoughts. Maybe you like the sermon, maybe you don't. That's okay. Study the Bible. I don't really care. I just want you to go to heaven. And if, like James, you've walked away from God, I want to challenge you to get right with God. To study the Bible and let's get restored.
You know, our second point as we quickly close out. Our first point was what? Jesus you. And our second point is, do you see Jesus? Ooh. Look back in Matthew 14. Let's go, Jason. I think we're starting to get full this morning. <laughs> Matthew 14, now of course you remember, Jesus walked on water. They thought he was a ghost. He said, guys, don't be afraid. Of course, why did he look like a ghost? Because he had a nine-hour quiet time, just like in the Man of Transfiguration, right? When he, when he was super white, like, like whiter than any bleach could bleach him. Jesus was flat, fired up from his quiet time. But of course, once, once he walks close to them, there, there's an incident that happens. Take, take a look here with me. Let's go on an adventure in the Bible together. Come, come with me. Verse 27. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage as I, don't be afraid. That's reassuring. Lord, if it is you, there's always one. <laughs> Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, now can you see the wind? Now he's distracted. He was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said to him, why did you doubt? Then they climbed to the boat. The wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And all of Texas said, amen. I don't think you see what just happened here. This is some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, we understand God can walk on water, right? Jesus. But here's what I, I, I really want you to embrace this here. Right, right. Peter's a man like you and me. Right. P- Peter's a man that didn't go to UCLA either. He was unschooled. Yeah. He was ordinary. Peter was flesh and blood. But Peter saw Jesus walking on water. He saw the impossible and said, I'm going to do it too. Wow. Peter defied the laws of gravity, broke the laws of physics, and stepped on H2O. Can you believe that? A man, like, this is actual history, guys. This actually happened. Like, let's try it after. Let's go put Jay in the pool. You know what I mean? Like, it, it actually, let this build your faith. Let this build your faith. Jesus allowed a man to walk on water till what? Till he took his eyes off him. And the moment he took his eyes off, what does Jesus equate that to? When you take your eyes off him, you don't have faith. The moment he didn't have faith, he began to sink. Same thing for us this morning. The moment we take our eyes off Christ, the moment we doubt, is the moment we begin to sink spiritually. Oh, but there's so much going on in my life. Oh, but there's sins I need to repent of. And there's people, and he hurt me. Do you know what she said? He didn't turn that call in time. And oh, they're asking for special missions again. And this is going, all oh, this stuff. No, stop being a crybaby. You lack faith. It's a faith issue, not a leader issue. Not a Bible talk leader issue. Not your bank, not your husband, not your wife. It's your faith. You know, it's important that we understand this concept as ultimately we're in the year of vision. Let's talk about vision here. As the goals, uh, church, the churches, we have some goals here. Of course, Dallas Fort Worth has the goal to get to 100 for the Lord this year. I, I was at their winter workshop. They were fired up for the goal. Are they still fired up for the goal? And at our winter workshop, we gave the goal to go to 50 disciples in Houston. But, bro, do we really need goals? Like, come on, can't we just be like happy disciples? Like, why does, why, why does the church leader need to be a blue? You know what I'm saying? Like, why, why can't we just go have some fun? Why can't we just chill? Why, like, let's just let the church grow. You're being so legalistic. There's too much structure here, bro. I don't see structure in the Bible. You should read the book of Numbers. We'll talk about that in another sermon. Let's talk about reality here. Yeah. Yeah. Houston today has 30 disciples once James gets restored. Yeah. Now, Tyler really pushed me. That's all good disciples, all coaches. He said, bro, you got to do some math. Figure out the percentage of how many people are in Houston, 7 million, and at what, what is the percentage of 30? And I said, that's so I Googled it this morning. I don't find it. <laughs> and I found it. Come on, bro. 
because Jesus sees me. So it's, it's quite interesting. The percentage of 30 to 7 million is 0.00001% of the population. That's who we are compared to what God has called us to do. But, but then I looked at Dallas. They're not 7 million. They're 7 million 500. That's 500 more thousand guys. So it's pretty intense. So they have about 70 disciples. So I did that math. And seven, it, it's quite interesting. It's 0.00001% of your population. That's who we are compared to what God has called us to do. Do you think that's God's goal for us to be 0.00001% of the population? I don't think so. What is God's plan? 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are four steps. You better remember, he wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. See, no matter how you feel about the goals, I want to persuade you that God wants all men to be saved because the people aren't true biblical disciples of Jesus Christ. They will not go to heaven. If someone is not part of the body of Christ, they cannot go to heaven. You know, I I don't want to ask how you feel about the church goals. How do you feel about God's goal? To get every member in, not not, not, not Houston and Dallas, Texas, the world. In the first century, literally, they were physically martyred. They were skinned alive. They were asked death for this goal. Talk about sacrifice. How do you feel about God's goal? Or maybe you really don't like God's goal because you're so focused on your goal. So when the church leader says something that resonates, a goal that gets in the way of building up your life, you say, woo, why are you going to go there? Because you have your eyes on people in the church and you stop looking at God. It's the year of vision. Maybe you should put your glasses back on. For many of us, it's time to get our eyes back on Jesus. When you're not looking at Jesus, you're going to sink. And I really want to challenge you as we begin to close out. Stop obsessing over a goal either way. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Don't upset. It's not about the goal. The goal is not the goal. Amen, Dallas Fort Worth. Amen. Don't obsess over the goal. Obsess over your relationship with Jesus. Amen. How do we see Jesus? Well, of course, Jay Jackson had an incredible time preaching our campus devotion on Friday night there. Yay. You can clap for him. Yay. And he taught us this incredible scripture in John 1, 1 and 2 and then verse 14, how Jesus is God. Isn't that incredible? Of course, Jesus is the Word, and the Word became flesh. So we understand an equation here. The Bible equals Jesus. So by us looking at the Word of God, guess what? We're actually looking at who? You guessed it. Jesus Christ. You know, I want to give you a challenge. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Reignite your quiet times. Like It's the simplest thing. After nine years as a disciple, now as an evangelist, the most exciting part of my day is not meetings. It's the Word of God. It's having my personal quiet times. Let's renew. Dallas, you had a challenge to read the whole Bible this year. How's it going? Tyler told me last night he's black. Cranking. I said, bro, that's inspiring in numbers. You're killing it. Zephaniah? How do you even say that? That's crazy. (laughs) How's it going, Houston? We gave you the same challenge. Are you reading through the whole Bible this year? And I want to challenge you not just to read the Bible, but believe it. When it says the harvest is plentiful, guess what? When it says you can change, guess what? When it says don't worry, God will provide, that means guess what? You can give your missions and God will still provide for your family. Guess what? You can seek for the kingdom and God will still take care of your family. When the Bible says that God will do immeasurably more, let me tell you, you don't have to worry about your dreams. God will bring them into fruition once he's put you through in a fire. We must have a conviction, Texas, as we close out, that we, we've already seen the impossible here. We've already seen it. 2016, Dallas-Fort Worth, we were having a t- tough time. Tyler and Shay were, but I think we were having a much, much, much worse time. Yeah. And Richie and Elizabeth came down, and they gave us, you guys just have faith. We said, what do you mean we do have faith? You guys just got to have faith. And, of course, I joined you down at the UTA Bible Talk a lot of times, and Richie came down and let it, it let it, and we had no visitors for a while. We had 16 visitors, and Richie let it. Oh. Tyler and I were like, oh, oh mommy. Like... <laughs> Is what we got to drink some of what he's drinking. <laughs> then my evangelist, Tyler Shears, lived the next day. He had over 20 visitors at Bible Talk. <laughs> you know why? 
Because we put our eyes back on Jesus. Not just Tyler, but then he called me and we called the whole church and we looked at Jesus. And then we saw 17 additions and 17 weeks and we hit special missions during that same time. Houston, we came down here in 20, 2018, let's be honest, and we had a remnant group here. We had a church that was hurting. We had sexual morality going on in the church. We had drugs going on in the church. We had a lot of sin going on in the church. And guess what? We opened the Bible and said, let's do it God's way. Whoever doesn't, there's the door. Let's do it. And my first year as a church leader, I did a great job. We grew by negative percents. We're from over 30 to 19. But I just knew it. I said, if, 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 if we honor God and take care of the sin, God will grow the family. And then in 2019, 19 disciples had 18 baptisms, over 70% growth for the Lord. But today's the day, Texas. Yes, to rejoice for the past, but no longer to say, those were our glory days. But the miracles are but ahead today. God is beginning to write history for Texas. Today, he's beginning to write history for Dallas. For Houston, for all of Texas, for the world. Let's evangelize the world. Let's walk on water in this generation. Amen. Yeah.